Warning, Kind of Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. I turn around and I'm apologizing to the other people that are watching it, and their eyes are looking past me, and they all, they're all just like white and petrified. And one of my friends says, oh, that's much worse. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kind of Murdery, a true crime podcast that's mostly about murder and always about the strange and compelling stories that arise when the path less traveled twists to darkness and those who walk its shadows surrender to violence and moral corruption. We have a perilous journey ahead, so thank you for lending me your courage and good company. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg, and this is Kind of Murdery. I'm back again, coming to you from snowy Tahoe. There was a howler of a blizzard on Tuesday that dropped 16 inches of snow and shut down the resorts and roads. Fingers crossed those roads will be open today so I can head for Palm Springs and meet the spawners at the risk. I'm optimistic they will be, but back to talking about the snowstorm. I woke up to the sound of avalanche bombs shaking the house when I got up early to edit on Wednesday morning. Hey, and this is cool, especially if you're a history geek like me, but Kirkwood actually has a functioning World War II howitzer, which is essentially an anti-tank cannon that they fire at the Cirque Ridge, that's the highest ridge above the resort, to knock dangerous, unstable snow overhangs down before the public arrives. That's right, they shell the mountain with an honest-to-God howitzer, all in the name of your safety. And if that's not kind of murdery, well then I don't know what is. All right, time to focus here. I'm in my mobile podcast studio again, complete with duct tape mics and a stack of DVDs and books to ensure the mic is tall enough to talk into. If you're curious about exactly what's in that stack, well, even if you're not curious, I'm gonna tell you anyway. The Foundation is a 007 Spectre Blu-ray followed by three John Cipollina, a legendary ice pick in your temple rock and roll guitarist, John Cipollina DVDs topped off by the Oxford American Dictionary. That's my microphone extension plan, so uh, there you go. And as you're likely aware, I'm back for my third visit with original Magic the Gathering artist, icon and iconoclast Anson Maddox. This is part three of Wizards of Death, the true story of Russia's magic murders, and that's right, I said part three. So if you haven't heard parts one and two yet, go back and listen to them and then rejoin us. We'll save you a seat. If you're all caught up, well then I'm just gonna jump right in. We'll be rewinding just a bit. Entering the conversation in the midst of the story of Gosha the Wizard as Anson and I are discussing the fact that Russians have an enduring belief even to the present day in the reality and efficacy of wizards, witches, and witchcraft. And from there, we intend to uncover what truths we can and solve what mysteries we may. And Anson brings us a true kind of murdery story from his own life. Wizards of Death, the true story of Russia's magic murders with Anson Maddox, part three, starts now. It was common especially around the turn of the century, for Russians to go to explicitly titled and in fact licensed by the state witches. Being a witch doctor was an actual officially recognized profession and you had to pay the government for a license to do it. So the point here being that as wild as this all sounds, there's actually a really long, even ancient cultural tradition of believing in these sorts of mystics and in the efficacy of what they do, which adds a little bit of understanding to why this guy was so successful. People weren't just dumb. It's like this is something you do in Russia. It's hard to argue with something your grandmother told you since you're a kid. Right. That's why. Like a lot of these, a lot of these beliefs are very persistent. Yeah. And if, if every other person believes in it, then, you know, makes it, harder to get away from. Yeah, that's true. And that's also why it's so darn difficult to stamp out, uh, you know, intolerant or bigoted beliefs that we all may sort of know are, are well past their time and odious. But as you're alluding to, when, when generations of people espouse them 
or when they're espoused by somebody you love deeply, even if that particular belief is wrong, it can be hard to condemn a person you love, which can make it difficult as well to pull yourself away from a belief that you may find distasteful, speaking generally. Right. You know, it's hard to walk away from something when you're defending one of your loved ones, you know, right. The, the things that they believe in and somebody else is like bashing it. You're think you're, you can be torn in that moment. Right. So here we go back to it. Long history of this stuff in Russia, whether they, whether it's fortune telling mirrors or bringing back dead people from the grave in modern Russia, the belief of the power of the wizard lives on. Every kiosk sells newspapers publishing long lists of advertisements for masters of magic who promise to fix a person's success in love, sexual life, or business. Masters of magic, huh? I'm not sure. In the context of Magic the Gathering, although I play a lot of it myself, I don't think a master of magic would be the person I would necessarily go to first to fix my love or sexual life. Just, just going to throw that out there. <laughs> Oh boy. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> so such alternative healers and magic thrive in the country where only 15% of the population trusts the state medical system. This is according to the Levada Center survey and where many citizens remain suspicious of the merits of modern medicine. So there's maybe a political consequence thing happening here too, where in a country where the government is so repressive and controlling because the modern medical system is run by the repressive state, people are much less likely to trust a traditional doctor, which makes them, in sort of a zero-sum game sense, more likely to trust these charlatan wizards. So there, there's your context. So despite his lavish lifestyle, Matt Erosian's greed got the better of him, and he devised a scheme to earn cash even quicker. Here it was. He would befriend a future victim and use his charm to convince them to transfer all of their funds into cash, bag the cash, and go to him, where the two would ostensibly travel to a grandmother living 300 kilometers away from Moscow. Gosha would claim that they would amass numerous riches via his magical powers. So what his scam was that these people bought into was, take all the money you have, bring it to me, and I will essentially, like, tribbles cause your money to physically multiply alongside my grandmother right there in front of your face which just sounds super wacky but people buy into all kinds of stuff i guess this kind of, this kind of sounds like church too <laughs> yeah i will bless your cash and you will have more cash yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what is it a seed or something yeah yeah, yeah. right oh man yeah oh, i'm sorry <laughs> no it's, it's <laughs> please go yeah, on you know, it's true it's true i mean I don't want to get too far afield. The people are of, I respect everyone's beliefs, but you do, you have a point there. Oh, I would be remiss. Now you mentioned you went to the magazine store sometimes to look for uh -huh. visual inspiration. So what, what were some magazines that you found some visual inspiration in? Uh, the French photo magazines. I had a lot of those. They were, uh, it just, they, the, the high contrast going between, you know, sexy images to kind of shocking images. It was uh, mm -hmm. kind of pulpy uh, reference material. Got it. Can you give me any actual titles of any of the magazines? Do you recall any of them? Uh, French Photo is... Oh, it's, it's called I don't think French. they call it... I, I, well, I don't think it's I, okay. French Photo. It's just, it's it's Photo Magazine, and it, the French version of it is a lot different than Got the it. American version. Got it. Very, Just like very the cool. Difference between heavy metal and metal herlant. So was heavy metal another one that you would sometimes look at? It was. Oh, yeah, I, I remember yeah, I, those I, very well too. Yeah, I was uh, collecting those since I was nine years old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, as long as it wasn't too violent, my mom was pretty uh, okay with me absorbing media. Mm -hmm. Much less kinds. concerned about violence than sex. My parents too. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, going back to your mom didn't let you watch Mr. Rogers because she didn't want you to trust strangers <laughs> of, which is a, which is an amazing call. It totally makes sense. He's sort of humorous in light of what a sort of cultural luminary Mr. Rogers has become all these exactly. years later. But just the other day, I was out with my daughter, Daisy, who's 11, and she told she tells me a joke and she goes, Dad, she says, what's a kidnapper's favorite shoes? You want to guess what a kidnapper's favorite shoes are? 
I don't know. White vans. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh my. You know goodness. what? Brenda's going to love that. Yeah. <laughs> my wife has the most horrific jokes. Oh, uh, yeah. I was like, well, you know, I guess, honey, I'm glad that you are aware of that. That's, that's sort of the direction I went with it. <laughs> but I was reminded of that when you mentioned your mom. Oh, yeah. My opinion of Mr. Rogers is better than it was then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, then it's been decided. We like Mr. Rogers just the way he is. Dead and buried. <laughs> I kid. Of course Fred Rogers is basically a saint. Uh, speaking of saints, let's dive back into the story of our sinner, huh? We return to Gosha the Wizard. So the first victim, potential victim that he chooses is a married businesswoman named Olga R. But to his surprise, he accidentally picked a cannier woman than he thought, and she caught onto his bluff and cut off all contact with him. So he thought to himself, well, this plan doesn't really seem to be working so he got rid of the money and grandmother part of the plan and instead offered to perform magic rituals in his client's homes. Matarosian's first alleged victim was 23-year-old Natalia Trapeznikova, a beauty queen and aspiring model who arrived in Moscow from Nizvi Novogord looking for love and success. She used to thumb through photos of rich bankers in Russian Forbes dreaming that one of them would marry her one day. She saved money for a business startup, her friend said, but then she apparently fell in with Gosha the Wizard. Due to an injury she'd suffered as a teenager while rowing, Natalia suffered from spinal disc herniation, which caused her pain and discomfort while walking in heels and on the catwalk. During her last visit home, Natalia reportedly told her parents that a Moscow magician named Gosha had advised her, and here we go, this is similar to the original scheme, had advised her to withdraw all the cash she had in her bank accounts to give to him so that he could charge the money with energy meant to multiply her fortunes. Her father, Valerie, protested against the strange affair, but his daughter apparently did not listen to them. He said, Natalia liked round figures. She said she had one million rubles, which is more, or was at the time, more than $30,000. After being taken in by Gosha's claims of spiritual healing several years before, he'd managed to convince her to cut off contact with her boyfriend and convince her that a friend from the modeling agency had attempted to poison her. So, you know, just like a cult leader, again, he's isolating her from the good influences in her life and convincing her that they're bad influences. So he got her to cut off contact with the people who might protect her, and knowing that she fully believed in everything he said, he came up with this give me your $30,000 scheme. On September 21st, 2011, she arrives in Moscow and sits waiting for him in her apartment. At some point during the night, he arrives and enters and offers to make drinks for them. Then he went to the kitchen and got a glass of alcohol, which he laced with a mixture of heroin and methadone. Not long after drinking it, Natalia passes out and Gosha injects her with a syringe containing more heroin dis before disposing of it and giving her another clean one in an attempt to simulate an overdose. However, either by miscalculation or by underestimating the strength of Natalia, she didn't die but simply remained unconscious. Anxious that his plan wasn't working, this guy takes her to the bathroom and drowns her. Then he pours out some food for her dog, grabs the cash in the kitchen and some extra jewelry, and leaves. The following morning, Natalia's parents have been calling her, and she's not obviously answering or returning her calls. So they call Matt Erosian. Actually, they write to Matt Erosian through a friend, a mutual friend that knew both of them, and asked what happened to Natalia. And Gosha the wizard, Matt Erosian, claimed that he hadn't seen her in four days and that she was on vacation in Georgia. Alarmed, her parents traveled to Moscow, and upon arrival, they noticed that the light has been left on in her apartment. They contact the landlady who opens the door and finds Natalia dead in the bathtub. So apparently because of that herniated disc back injury that I had referred to earlier, Natalia did have something of a history with pain-killing drugs, and so even her parents initially suspect that she may in fact have overdosed. But then they start to wonder if something else might have occurred because the syringe, ultimately the police tell them, lacked any fingerprints, and it appeared to have been scrubbed precisely as though somebody had made a great effort to erase the evidence of another party, which we know somebody did, Gosha the Wizard. 
But despite these suspicions, no official criminal investigation was initiated. Well, four months later, two more of Matt Erosian's patients were found dead under similar circumstances. Through his contact with models, he came across 21-year-old Maria and 38-year-old Natalia, same name as the first victim, Natalia Argarkovi, a mother and daughter from Krasnodar. Man, this is like, I am having a tough time with all these like originally Cyrillic transcribed into English names. My apologies. I feel like a feel like a, a rank amateur here, but... It's a lot of consonants. Uh, yeah. Come on, Russians, make it easier for me. That, <laughs> you don't have anything else more important going on right now, do you? <laughs> all right. So he kills a mother and daughter. Same deal. They're found dead in their apartments, apparently from overdose. Each of them had more than 20 times as much heroin in their bodies as the first Natalia. So clearly Gosha thought, gosh, I almost didn't use enough on the first lady. So he just really went for it on the second two. And they're found in the same way. He then moves on again. And he is believed to, although not convicted of... He is believed to have been involved in the disappearance of a fourth woman named Ina Filpova, a 31-year-old businesswoman from the same town who was a longtime client of his, who on December 29, 2011, was last seen carrying all of her savings with her and was en route to Gosha's apartment. Her body has never been found. While examining the Argakov's apartment, this is the mother and daughter pair of victims, investigators noticed something peculiar. In the ashtray... Next to the light cigarettes that Natalia was known to smoke, they found standard ones with teeth imprints of an unidentified male. After investigating their friends and their phone call histories, they were eventually led to Matt Erosion. Coincidentally, perhaps, he smoked the same type of cigarettes, which were also found in the first Natalia, Natalia Trapnizkova's ashtray. So, this guy who had been so careful about some things left his teeth-bitten cigarettes in the ashtrays of all of his victims. That don't seem so smart. <laughs> Not as bad as Ted Bundy, though. He left his teeth prints on, his, on one of his victims, at least. Yeah, that's... Considering that so many people are identified by dental records, that does seem pretty foolish for a purportedly genius-level intellect, that's for sure. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah... So he left his bitten cigarettes in the ashtrays of all of his victims. Gosha, with the cigarette connection, was arrested and his house was searched, at which point the authorities found 6.6 kilos of heroin on the premises. Huh. I have a question. Instead of murdering all these women and taking their life savings, how about just sell 6.6 .6 kilos of heroin? That's worth some money. I mean, did he get... M it, obvi <laughs> it obviously wasn't just about the money. <laughs> obviously. I mean, I was going to say, did he even get enough money from his victims to pay for all the heroin he bought to kill them? You know? It might... Your your sentence for selling heroin in Russia might be worse than uh, murder. Model murder, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of selling heroin in Russia? Don't. Just murder models. Yeah. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Uh, all right. They find all that heroin, at which point he admits to being in the first victim's apartment, but he claims that she had gotten drunk, done cocaine, and then had oral sex with him before she undressed and went to the bathroom, and then he felt grossed out by it all, packed his stuff, and left. That's That, that was his version of that story. Mm -hmm. But the police, who initially had failed to check the security footage, which is bizarre checked it now and discovered that you could clearly see Gosha leaving the apartment, carrying with him some kind of heavy package. At which point, they now had enough evidence to charge him with the murders. When you combine the security footage with the heroin, as well as the decorations and cards, which I hadn't mentioned yet, but they found a bunch of knickknacks that had belonged to his second set of mother and daughter victims in his home. But originally, it had taken more than a year for the police to investigate the first murder. The chairman of the security committee of the state parliament in Russia, a man named Alexander, said that, quote, There are as many charlatans among policemen as among magicians. That seems like a quote for a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. 
And if it weren't for Keenstein's involvement, Gosha the Wizard might still be luring beautiful women to his services. But the chairman of the security committee, upon hearing the pleas of Natalia, the first Natalia's parents, pushed the police to look into the killing. They discovered, as I said, the security footage, and which also included not only Matarosian, but Trapsnikova herself entering Matarosian's building with a plastic bag in her hand. And this is the kicker. The footage of Matarosian, of Gosha the Wizard, leaving a couple hours later, and he's carrying the same plastic bag that she entered with. It was only after police compared the CCTV footage from all the crime scenes that they realized each time the same man was seen entering and leaving the apartment buildings with a sports bag in three different regions of Moscow. So there you go. Once they actually bothered to look at the apartment security footage of each of the murder victims, there he was coming and going with the same bag under his arm each time. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it took a, a Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot or whoever the Russian version of that would be to solve this case. It was like, just, just try it all, please. Try it all <laughs> and look what happens. So as for Gosha the Wizard... He went with the old shaggy boombastic excuse, which is, you know, saw banging on the counter, it wasn't me. He went with, yeah, it looks like me, but it's not me. That, that, that was his answer. <laughs> Even though I had... A lot of people are trying to steal my style, man. <laughs> yeah, man, people are biting my look. Exactly. <laughs> Just... Get off my coattails. Yeah, despite the fact that there was all this evidence that he knew all these women and that he had their possessions in his house and his cigarette butts at their houses and himself on the camera coming and going in all three different places. He was like, yeah, you know, it's just my doppelganger. Just, just, just my twin. I was so framed. Yeah. So at his trial, Matt Erosian vehemently denied his guilt and often insulted everybody present in the courtroom, including the judge himself. Sounds like a good strategy. When interviewed by the press, he claimed that the deaths were accidental overdoses and that he should be acquitted. As for the various interrogations and the things that he did admit, he claims he was tortured by the police who electrocuted him, according to him, and didn't allow him to eat for two days. He additionally alleged that they planted the drugs at his home. I wouldn't say it's impossible that police plant drugs. On the flip side, considering these were cases that they didn't even investigate and didn't even want to investigate, It seems pretty unlikely that when they finally got around to it, only at the repeated urgings of a member of parliament, that they then showed up with six and a half kilos of heroin to plant. Like, like, (laughs) are the cops showing up with a, with like a roller bag from the airport being like, knock, knock, can we come in? Yeah, what's in the luggage? Oh, nothing. Can I use your bathroom? Like, I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh (laughs) So on April 22nd, 2014, the Moscow court found Mount Erosion guilty of the three murders of robbery and of drug trafficking and sentenced him to 23 years imprisonment. In addition to requiring him to pay 23 million rubles in damages to the victim's families, Noticeably about 25% less than the number of rubles that he stole from the first Natalia. That seems like kind of a light sentence. Three murders, robbery, <laughs> and heroin trafficking 23 years i mean like 23 years is a long time but those those are three fairly serious those are crimes some lives that aren't uh, coming back for yeah. any reason and like you said he probably got 20 years for the drug trafficking a year for the robbery and two years for the murders i, I don't know that i don't mean to be unnecessarily um what's the word i don't mean to be unnecessarily flippant but yeah we don't mean to make stuff up no 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 <laughs> but it, but I am, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just supposing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so at a later date, after he was sentenced to 23 years, his defense did manage to lower his sentence by one month. So he got 22 years, 11 months. He was sent to what's called a special regime colony in Siberia. Is that a gulag? I, I believe that is the, the churched up name for a gulag, yes. A special regime colony. In Siberia, which is another, just to bring it full circle here, it's another Rasputin tie-in, right? Where was Rasputin from? Siberia. Where does Gosha end up? Siberia. And he is still there to this day with, I guess, let's see, can I do basic math? 13 years left on his, 14 years left on his sentence? 
So that's wow. that is the story of Gosha the wizard. Well, these uh, these stories just kind of keep themselves perpetuated, don't they? He's going to get out and uh, yeah, continue. He he may. I mean that that's the thing. He he was in his you know he's in his earlyish forties, I believe. So he's definitely not going to be too old to kill when they release him. Especially because he's described as like a huge muscular man. He's probably going to have some of that old man prison strength when he gets out of Siberian prison. Probably a <laughs> lot more dangerous than he was before. Yeah. Everyone, like, don't get involved with anybody claiming to be a wizard who's going to cleanse your karma and cause your money to multiply like tribbles. Okay, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> All right, so Anson, I would love to ask you... As I try to do with every guest I'm lucky to have on the show, but I am particularly curious about your story, I have to say, given that I personally am such a big fan of yours. Do you have a kind of murdery story from your own life that you would be willing to share with me and, and with the listeners? Uh, yeah. Um, there's one that's maybe a little too close to home uh, that I probably don't think... I'm the one that should tell it. Okay. Uh, okay. Do, do you want to uh, yeah, my, preview it and then I'll cut it, or do you just want to go to something else? It's totally your call. Well, my my uh, brother-in-law, who I never got the chance to meet, uh, was murdered. Oh, and gosh. And that was... That was... Uh, yeah. I, wow, that was that's a, a disaster. That's horrible. Um, but... Uh, Brenda actually gave me, she said, if you want to talk about that, you can. And I, and I thought, I, I don't think that would be, uh, the kind, I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell it in a way that would make it. Maybe sometime you can come back on and come back on with Brenda and she could tell it if she wants, but, but that, that would be more appropriate. I, I think. think so too. So, so, so give me, give me another one. And, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be like. To me, kind of murdery can run the gamut from something actually terrible to something as weird as, like, I got my pocket picked by a circus dwarf and woke up with a headache type of deal. So <laughs> I it, do have some, I have something that is a little, uh, it's unusual. So, so it might yeah, be so you can tell one that, that airs more on the side of fun, even if you want. It doesn't have to be so dark. However, whatever you want to Well, tell. it's both. Okay, perfect. It's, That's the show. It's something that is dark enough to where you have to laugh at it to to get over it. I think. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I was telling you about killing the spider, right? Yeah, I I like spiders. Mm. I actually, you know, I go out of my way to avoid hurting them, right? Because I think they're incredibly interesting. They're beautiful. So they're also helping us out most of the time. They they yeah, eat the mosquitoes exactly. and all the other stuff that actually harm us, right? Yeah. And the jumping spiders have a thing for hanging out with me. So <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do have a story that involves a barbecue that went very wrong. This was like in probably 1997. I had some friends over. The idea was to barbecue. And one of my friends brought over some lobster. And I was thinking, I guess that's possible. Yeah. They didn't seem to be alive. <laughs> and I, so I thought, okay, I should probably cut them in half, maybe, and just put them on the, the barbecue. Right. Because again, you couldn't just easily Google how to grill lobster in 1990. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 55 uh, minutes later. Right, I didn't right, find right. Anything. Yeah. Okay, continue. Well, Okay, so I took a large knife and I cut them in half lengthwise. Mm. Mm -hmm. And no no protest, you know, no reaction. And I brought them to the grill outside. You know, the guests were around, standing around on the porch. Mm -hmm. And I put them on the grill and they came to life. Oh, my God. And it was... It, it was disturbing <laughs> and you know, everybody's watching and I, I, I had a piece of tinfoil out there that I, you know, was for wrapping something, I guess, but I tried to put the tinfoil over them and just press it down onto oh my them God. <laughs> to, uh, 
and I turn around <laughs> and I'm apol- <laughs> yeah, I turn around and I'm apologizing to the other people that are watching it, and their eyes are looking past me, and they all they're all just like white and petrified. And one of my friends says, "Oh, that's much worse." And I turn around, and the tinfoil is undulating, just undulating you know and your imagination takes over and it's a, it's worse than you know probably it was oh my god but uh yeah some people left and it was a yeah it was a disaster for a oh barbecue. my god wow that's insane and and i was the only one that uh well okay i i i didn't feel like eating them but i did and they were delicious let me just put that out there <laughs> i'm sure they were i don't even remember i just remember like this is the least i could do <laughs> yeah they can't just be thrown it'd be disrespectful to th- of their agony well, and death absolutely. To throw them in the trash yeah yeah wow yeah i so yeah kids at home you, you always boil them yeah i guess it's the only way to so I mean, even that even that sounds barbaric, but uh, so I have it's better than <laughs> yeah I have grilled lobster before, but I I believe it was previously frozen. Like I bought it at Costco, so like there was no question mm-hmm. of it being uh, expired, dead. Um, but yeah, they right. do. I mean, I have also boiled them, and you hear them scrabbling around in the pot, not for long, and and it is a little heart wrenching. But on the other hand, my God, they're so delicious. Uh, <laughs> And, and part of me also feels like maybe it's not such a bad thing that if we're going to choose to consume animals and I am, I respect everyone's choices and beliefs. I myself am an unapologetic omnivore, but at the same time, I think that maybe it's healthy to experience something of the animal's suffering and to understand the truth of what you're doing. Uh, with modern supermarkets, you know, it's like the meat is all just, it's just in a package. We've become very disconnected from the cycle of life and death that is the reality of eating animals. Um, so as horrifying as it is, I mean, your, yours is like an absolute horror movie, but I think that it's not necessarily a negative to feel that pang of regret or guilt that the that the animal is, is dying for you, you know? I, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, I think most people who are, you know, if they want to become vegetarians... You know, tour a slaughterhouse. Yeah. It should help. <laughs> it might yeah. give you other problems, but uh, yep. yeah, I think you should face the the demons that are part of what you are consuming. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Well, you know, it, it started as a nice lobster barbecuing story, and then <laughs> at, at least spiritually, it felt like it got very kind of murdery there. So I think we nailed the objective there, Ed. <laughs> Oh boy. I, I gotta say, I, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. So you've got this wonderful website, which is AnsonMaddox.com. And tell us a little bit about, if I go to AnsonMaddox.com, what will I find there? Uh, you will find artist proofs. Uh, I'm currently uh, trying to uh, pick up you know, the uh, slack on a backlog uh, with a personal... Uh, yeah, like painting on the backs mm-hmm. of the proofs is something mm-hmm. that I've been doing for a little while now. And uh, I'm trying to catch up with that. But uh, we have prints and artist proofs. And uh, the prices are all different because of the availability sure. and, you know, rarity of each one. But uh, Brenda is a great communicator. My wife, my business manager. She's an absolutely wonderful person. I, I adore her. She's not like other girls. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's an unusual and amazing person. That's very cool. Uh, uh, so, yeah, you'll be communicating with her, but uh, I, I hear what she's, uh, how she's connecting with people. And uh, it's pretty general, I guess. Our business is, is uh, dependent on people interested in magic and the, uh, the collectability of the proofs and sure, and, but, and people can also commission card alters, uh, potentially original art, signatures, various things. They just need to get in touch with you and Brenda, and, and you can make their Anson Maddox art dreams come true if they go head over to <laughs> AnsonMaddox.com. You can also find a link to AnsonMaddox.com, Anson's website, in the Kind of Murdery show notes for this episode, and I'll be posting it on social media as well. Don't hesitate to reach out. 
Anson's wife, Brenda, is super kind, awesome, and very responsive. All right, well, before we say goodbye, I did want to mention really quickly, as I often do to everyone listening, that there is a free three-digit lifeline number, 988, that you can call anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to receive immediate counseling for substance use, mental health, or suicidal thoughts. So God forbid, but if you find yourself in acute crisis, please do call 988, program it into your phone now, and please do remember that the world is a better place with you in it. If you'd like to connect with me, you can also reach out to me at kindamurdery at gmail.com, at kindamurdery on all social media, or you can call 888-MURDERY, 888-687-3379, and I would love it if you called 888-MURDERY to tell me your own kind of murdery story so that you can inspire an episode of the show. Anson, once again, thank you so much for being here. It's been something of a, of a dream come true for me to get to spend this time with you. I've admired you since I was literally a small child, so it's not inaccurate to say that you're one of my heroes, and to get to spend all this time with you is just a phenomenal. Thank you so much, sir, for, for your time and for the wonderful stories and uh, insights thank that you, you shared with us. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I can inspire good things and uh, not bad things. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, for Anson Maddox, I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. <laughs>